After the Dance, a short story by Leo Tolstoy. And you say that a man cannot, of himself, understand what is good and evil, that it is all environment, that the environment swamps the man. But I believe it is all chance. Take my own case. Thus spoke our excellent friend, Ivan Vasilievich, after a conversation between us on the impossibility of improving individual character without a change of the conditions under which men live. Nobody had actually said that one could not of oneself understand good and evil, but it was a habit of Ivan Vasilievich to answer in this way the thoughts aroused in his own mind by conversation and to illustrate those thoughts by relating incidents in his own life. He often quite forgot the reason for his story in telling it, but he always told it with great sincerity and feeling. He did so now. Take my own case. My whole life was moulded, not by environment, but by something quite different. By what, then? we asked. Oh, that is a long story. I should have to tell you about a great many things to make you understand. Well, tell us then. Ivan Vasilievich thought a little and shook his head. My whole life, he said, was changed in one night, or rather, morning. Why, what happened? one of us asked. What happened was that I was very much in love. I have been in love many times, but this was the most serious of all. It is a thing of the past. She has married daughters now. It was Varinka B. Even Vasilievich mentioned her surname. Even at fifty, she is remarkably handsome, but in her youth, at eighteen, she was exquisite, tall, slender, graceful, and stately. Yes, stately is the word. She held herself very erect, by instinct as it were, and carried her head high, and that together with her beauty and height gave her a queenly air in spite of being thin, even bony, one might say. It might indeed have been deterring had it not been for her smile, which was always gay and cordial, and for the charming light in her eyes, and for her youthful sweetness. What an entrancing description you give, Ivan Vasilievich. Description, indeed. I could not possibly describe her so that you could appreciate her. But that does not matter. What I am going to tell you happened in the forties. I was at that time a student in a provincial university. I don't know whether it was a good thing or no, but we had no political clubs, no theories in our universities then. We were simply young and spent our time as young men do, studying and amusing ourselves. I was a very gay, lively, careless fellow, and had plenty of money too. I had a fine horse and used to go tobogganing with the young ladies. Skating had not yet come into fashion. I went to drinking parties with my comrades. In those days we drank nothing but champagne. If we had no champagne, we drank nothing at all. We never drank vodka, as they do now. Evening parties and balls were my favourite amusements. I danced well, and was not an ugly fellow. Come, there is no need to be modest, interrupted a lady near him. We have seen your photograph. Not ugly, indeed. You were a handsome fellow. Handsome, if you like. That does not matter. When my love for her was at its strongest, on the last day of the carnival, I was at a ball at the provincial marshals, a good-natured old man, rich and hospitable, and a court chamberlain. The guests were welcomed by his wife, who was as good-natured as himself. She was dressed in puce-coloured velvet, and had a diamond diadem on her forehead, and her plump, old white shoulders and bosom were bare like the portraits of Empress Elizabeth the daughter of Peter the Great. It was a delightful ball. It was a splendid room, with a gallery for the orchestra, which was famous at the time, and consisted of serfs belonging to a musical landowner. The refreshments were magnificent, and the champagne flowed in rivers. Though I was fond of champagne, I did not drink that night, because without it I was drunk with love. But I made up for it by dancing waltzes and pokers till I was ready to drop, of course, whenever possible, with Varinka. She wore a white dress with a pink sash, white shoes, and white kid gloves, which did not quite reach to her thin, pointed elbows. A disgusting engineer named Anisimov robbed me of the mazurka with her. To this day I cannot forgive him. 
He asked her for the dance the minute she arrived, while I had driven to the hairdressers to get a pair of gloves and was late. So I did not dance the mazurka with her, but with a German girl to whom I had previously paid a little attention. But I am afraid I did not behave very politely to her that evening. I hardly spoke or looked at her and saw nothing but the tall, slender figure in a white dress with a pink sash, a flushed, beaming, dimpled face, and sweet, kind eyes. I was not alone. They were all looking at her with admiration, the men and women alike, although she outshone all of them. They could not help admiring her. Although I was not nominally her partner for the mazurka, I did as a matter of fact dance nearly the whole time with her. She always came forward boldly the whole length of the room to pick me out. I flew to meet her without waiting to be chosen, and she thanked me with a smile for my intuition. When I was brought up to her with somebody else, and she guessed wrongly, she took the other man's hand with a shrug of her slim shoulders and smiled at me regretfully. Whenever there was a waltz figure in the mazurka, I waltzed with her for a long time, and breathing fast and smiling, she would say, Encore. And I went on waltzing and waltzing as though unconscious of any bodily existence. Come now, how could you be unconscious of it with your arm round her waist? You must have been conscious not only of your own existence, but of hers, said one of the party. Even Vasilievich cried out, almost shouting in anger. There you are, moderns all over. Nowadays you think of nothing but the body. It was different in our day. The more I was in love, the less corporeal was she in my eyes. Nowadays you think of nothing but the body. It was different in our day. The more I was in love, the less corporeal was she in my eyes. Nowadays you set legs, ankles, and I don't know what. You undress the women you are in love with. In my eyes, as Alphonse Carr said, and he was a good writer, the one I loved was always draped in robes of bronze. We never thought of doing so. We tried to veil her nakedness, like Noah's good-natured son. Oh, well, you can't understand. Don't pay any attention to him. Go on, said one of them. Well, I danced for the most part with her, and did not notice how time was passing. The musicians kept playing the same mazurka tunes over and over again in desperate exhaustion. You know what it is towards the end of a ball. Papas and mamas were already getting up from the card tables in the drawing room in expectation of supper. The men servants were running to and fro bringing in things. It was nearly three o'clock. I had to make the most of the last minutes. I chose her again for the mazurka, and for the hundredth time we danced across the room. The quadrille after supper is mine, I said, taking her to her place. Of course, if I'm not carried off home, she said with a smile. I won't give you up, I said. Give me my fan anyhow, she answered. I'm so sorry to part with it, I said, handing her a cheap white fan. Well, here's something to console you, she said plucking a feather out of the fan and giving it to me. I took the feather and could only express my rapture and gratitude with my eyes. I was not only pleased and gay, I was happy, delighted. I was good, I was not myself, but some being not of this earth, knowing nothing of evil. I hid the feather in my glove and stood there unable to tear myself away from her. Look, they are urging father to dance she said to me, pointing to the tall, stately figure of her father, a colonel with silver epaulets who was standing in the doorway with some ladies. Varinka, come here, exclaimed our hostess, the lady with the diamond ferronier and with shoulders like Elizabeth in a loud voice. Varinka went to the door and I followed her. Persuade your father to dance the mazurka with you, ma chère. Do please, Peter Valdislavovich, she said, turning to the colonel. Varinka's father was a very handsome, well-preserved old man. He had a good colour, moustaches curled in the style of Nicholas Rumtsuan, and white whiskers which met the moustaches. His hair was combed onto his forehead, and a bright smile, like his daughter's, was on his lips and in his eyes. He was splendidly set up, with a broad military chest on which he wore some decorations, and he had powerful shoulders and long, slim legs.
He was that ultra-military type produced by the discipline of Emperor Nicholas the Fan. When we approached the door, the colonel was just refusing to dance, saying that he had quite forgotten how, but at that instant he smiled, swung his arm gracefully around to the left, drew his sword from its sheath, handed it to an obliging young man who stood near and smoothed his suede glove on his right hand. Everything must be done according to rule, he said with a smile. He took the hand of his daughter and stood one quarter turned, waiting for the music. At the first sound of the mazurka, he stamped one foot smartly, threw the other forward, and, at first slowly and smoothly, then buoyantly and impetuously, with stamping of feet and clicking of boots, his tall, imposing figure moved the length of the room. Varinka swayed gracefully beside him, rhythmically and easily, making her steps short or long, with her little feet in their white satin slippers. All the people in the room followed every movement of the couple. As for me, I not only admired, I regarded them with enraptured sympathy. I was particularly impressed with the old gentleman's boots, they were not the modern, pointed affairs, but were made of cheap leather, squared-toed, and evidently built by the regimental cobbler. In order that his daughter might dress and go out in society, he did not buy fashionable boots, but wore homemade ones, I thought, and his square toes seemed to me most touching. It was obvious that in his time he had been a good dancer, but now he was too heavy, and his legs had not spring enough for all the beautiful steps he tried to take. Still, he contrived to go twice round the room. When at the end, standing with legs apart, he suddenly clicked his feet together and fell on one knee, a bit heavily, and she danced gracefully around him, smiling and adjusting her skirt. The whole room applauded. Rising with an effort, he tenderly took his daughter's face between his hands. He kissed her on the forehead and brought her to me, under the impression that I was her partner for the mazurka. I said I was not. Well, never mind. Just go around the room once with her, he said, smiling kindly as he replaced his sword in the sheath. As the contents of a bottle flow readily when the first drop has been poured, so my love for Varinka seemed to set free the whole force of loving within me. In surrounding her, it embraced the world. I loved the hostess with her diadem and her shoulders like Elizabeth, and her husband and her guests and her footman, and even the engineer Anisimov, who felt peevish towards me. As for Varinka's father, with his homemade boots and his kind smile, so like her own, I felt a sort of tenderness for him that was almost rapture. After supper, I danced the promised quadrille with her, and though I had been infinitely happy before, I grew still happier every moment. We did not speak of love. I neither asked myself nor her whether she loved me, it was quite enough to know that I loved her, and I had only one fear, that something might come to interfere with my great joy. When I went home and began to undress for the night, I found it quite out of the question, held the little feather out of her fan in my hand and one of her gloves which she gave me when I helped her into the carriage after her mother. Looking at these things, and without closing my eyes, I could see her before me as she was for an instant when she had to choose between two partners. She tried to guess what kind of person was represented in me, and I could hear her sweet voice as she said, Pride, am I right? And merrily gave me her hand. At supper she took the first sip from my glass of champagne, looking at me over the rim with her caressing glance but plainest of all, I could see her as she danced with her father, gliding along beside him and looking at the admiring observers with pride and happiness. He and she were united in my mind in one rush of pathetic tenderness. I was living then with my brother, who has since died. He disliked going out and never went to dances, and besides, he was busy preparing for his last university examinations and was leading a very regular life. He was asleep. I looked at him, his head buried in the pillow and half covered with the quilt, and I affectionately pitied him, pitied him for his ignorance of the bliss I was experiencing. Our serf Petrusha had met me with a candle, ready to undress me, but I sent him away. His sleepy face and tousled hair seemed to me so touching. 
Trying not to make a noise, I went to my room on tiptoe and sat down on my bed. No, I was too happy. I could not sleep. Besides, it was too hot in the rooms. Without taking off my uniform, I went quietly into the hall, put on my overcoat, opened the front door, and stepped out into the street. It was after four when I had left the ball. Going home and stopping there a while had occupied two hours, so by the time I went out it was dawn. It was regular carnival weather, foggy, and the road full of water-soaked snow just melting and water dripping from the eaves. Varinka's family lived on the edge of town near a large field, one end of which was a parade ground. At the other end was a boarding school for young ladies. I passed through our empty little street and came to the main thoroughfare, where I met pedestrians and sledges laden with wood, the runners grating the road. The horses swung with regular paces beneath their shining yokes, their backs covered with straw mats and their heads wet with rain, while the drivers, in enormous boots, splashed through the mud beside the sledges. All this, the very horses themselves, seemed to me stimulating and fascinating full of suggestion. When I approached the field near their house, I saw at one end of it, in the direction of the parade ground, something very huge and black, and I heard sounds of fife and drum proceeding from it. My heart had been full of song, and I had heard in imagination the tune of the mazurka, but this was very harsh music. It was not pleasant. What can that be? I thought, and went towards the sound by a slippery path through the centre of the field. Walking about a hundred paces, I began to distinguish many black objects through the mist. They were evidently soldiers. It is probably a drill, I thought. So I went along in that direction in company with a blacksmith, who wore a dirty coat and an apron, and was carrying something. He walked ahead of me as we approached the place. The soldiers in black uniforms stood in two rows, facing each other motionless, their guns at rest. Behind them stood the fifes and drums, incessantly repeating the same unpleasant tune. What are they doing? I asked the blacksmith, who halted at my side. A tartar is being beaten through the ranks for his attempt to desert, said the blacksmith in an angry tone, as he looked intently at the far end of the line. I looked in the same direction and saw between the files something horrid approaching me. The thing that approached was a man, stripped to the waist, fastened with cords to the guns of two soldiers who were leading him. At his side, an officer in overcoat and cap was walking, whose figure had a familiar look. The victim advanced under the blows that rained upon him from both sides, his whole body plunging, his feet dragging through the snow. Now he threw himself backward, and the subalterns who led him thrust him forward. Now he fell forward, and they pulled him up short, while ever at his side marched the tall officer with firm and nervous pace. It was Varinka's father with his rosy face and white moustache. At each stroke the man, as if amazed, turned his face, grimacing with pain, towards the side whence the blow came and showing his white teeth repeated the same words over and over. But I could only hear what the words were when he came quite near. He did not speak them, he sobbed them out, Brothers, have mercy on me, brothers, have mercy on me. But the brothers had no mercy, and when the procession came close to me, I saw how a soldier who stood opposite me took a firm step forward, and lifting his stick with a whirr, brought it down upon the man's back. The man plunged forward, but the subalterns pulled him back, and another blow came down from the other side, then from this side, and then from the other. The colonel marched beside him, and looking now at his feet, and now at the man, inhaled the air, puffed out his cheeks, and breathed it out between his protruded lips. When they passed the place where I stood, I caught a glimpse between the two files of the back of the man that was being punished. It was something so many coloured, wet, red, unnatural, that I could hardly believe it was a human body. My God! muttered the blacksmith. The procession moved farther away. The blows continued to rain upon the writhing, falling creature. The fifes shrilled and the drums beat, and the tall, imposing figure of the colonel moved alongside the man just as before.
Then, suddenly, the colonel stopped and rapidly approached a man in the ranks. I'll teach you to hit him gently, I heard his furious voice say. Will you pat him like that? Will you? And I saw how his strong hand in the suede glove struck the weak, bloodless, terrified soldier for not bringing down his stick with sufficient strength on the red neck of the Tartar. Bring new sticks, he cried, and looking round, he saw me. Assuming an air of not knowing me, and with a ferocious, angry frown, he hastily turned away. I felt so utterly ashamed that I didn't know where to look. It was as if I had been detected in a disgraceful act. I dropped my eyes and quickly hurried home. All the way I had the drums beating and the fifes whistling in my ears, and I heard the words, Brothers, have mercy on me, or will you pat him? Will you? My heart was full of physical disgust that was almost sickness, so much so that I halted several times on my way, for I had the feeling that I was going to be really sick from all the horrors that possessed me at that sight. I do not remember how I got home and got to bed, but the moment I was about to fall asleep, I heard and saw again all that had happened, and I sprang up. Evidently he knows something I do not know, I thought about the colonel. If I knew what he knows, I should certainly grasp, understand, what I have just seen, and it would not cause me such suffering. But however much I thought about it, I could not understand the thing that the colonel knew. It was evening before I could get to sleep, and then only after calling on a friend and drinking till I was quite drunk. Do you think I had come to the conclusion that the deed I had witnessed was wicked? Oh, no since it was done with such assurance and was recognized by everyone as indispensable, they doubtless knew something which I did not know. So I thought, and tried to understand. But no matter, I could never understand it, then or afterwards. And not being able to grasp it, I could not enter the service as I had intended. I don't mean only the military service, I did not enter the civil service either, and so I have been of no use whatever as you can see. Yes, we know how useless you've been, said one of us. Tell us, rather, how many people would be of any use at all if it hadn't been for you. Oh, that's utter nonsense, said Ivan Vasilievich with genuine annoyance. Well, and what about the love affair? My love? It decreased from that day. When, as often happened, she looked dreamy and meditative, I instantly recollected the colonel on the parade ground, and I felt so awkward and uncomfortable that I began to see her less frequently, so my love came to naught. Yes, such chances arise, and they alter and direct a man's whole life, he said in summing up. The Devil, a novella by Leo Tolstoy. One, a brilliant career lay before Eugene Ertenev. He had all that was necessary for this, an admirable education at home, high honors when he graduated in law at Petersburg University, connections in the highest society through his recently deceased father, and he had himself already begun service in one of the ministries under the protection of the minister. He also had a fortune, even a large one, though insecure. His father had lived abroad and in Petersburg, allowing his sons, Eugene and Andrew, the elder who was in the horse guards, 6,000 rubles a year each, while he himself and his wife spent a great deal. He only used to visit his estate for a couple of months in summer and did not concern himself with its direction, entrusting it all to an unscrupulous manager who also failed to attend to it, but in whom he had complete confidence. After the father's death, when the brothers began to divide the property, there were found to be so many debts that their lawyer even advised them to refuse the inheritance and retain only an estate left them by their grandmother, which was valued at 100,000 rubles. But a neighboring landed proprietor who had done business with old Irtenev, that is to say, who had promissory notes from him and had come to Petersburg on that account, 
said that in spite of the debts they could straighten out affairs so as to retain a large fortune, it would only be necessary to sell the forest and some outlying land, retaining the rich Semenoff estate with 4,000 desiatinas of black earth, the sugar factory, and 200 desiatinas of water meadows, if one devoted oneself to the management and settling on the estate, farmed it wisely and economically. And so, having visited the estate in spring, his father had died in Lent, Eugene looked into everything, resolved to retire from the civil service, settle in the country with his mother, and undertake the management with the object of preserving the main estate. He arranged with his brother, with whom he was very friendly, that he would pay him 4,000 roubles a year, or alternatively would pay him 80,000 in a lump sum, while Andrew, on his part, handed over to him his share of the inheritance. So he arranged matters and, having settled down with his mother in the big house, ardently and yet cautiously began managing the estate. It is generally supposed that conservatives are usually old people, and those in favour of change are the young. That is not quite correct. The most usual conservatives are young people, those who want to live, but who do not think and have not time to. Think about how to live and who therefore take as a model for themselves a way of life that they have seen. Thus, it was with Eugene. Having settled in the village, his aim and ideal was to restore the form of life that had existed, not in his father's time, his father had been a bad manager, but in his grandfather's. And now in the house, the garden, in the estate management, of course with changes suited to the times, he tried to resurrect the general spirit of his grandfather's life, everything on a large scale, good order, method, and everybody satisfied. But so to arrange things entailed much work. It was necessary to meet the demands of the creditors and the banks, and for that purpose to sell some land and arrange renewals of credit. It was also necessary to get money to carry on, partly by farming out land and partly by hiring labour. The immense operations on the Semenoff estate, with its 400 desiatinas of plough land and its sugar factory, and to deal with the garden so that it should not seem to be neglected or in decay. There was much work to do, but Eugene had plenty of strength, physical and mental. He was 26, of medium height, strongly built, with muscles developed by gymnastics. He was full-blooded and very red over his whole neck, with bright teeth and lips and hair soft and curly, though not thick. His only physical defect was short-sightedness, which he had himself developed by using spectacles, so that he could not now do without a pince-nez, which had already formed a line at the top of his nose ridge. Such he was physically. For his spiritual portrait, it might be said that the better anyone knew him, the better they liked him. His mother had always loved him more than she loved anyone else, and now, after her husband's death, she concentrated on him not only her whole affection, but her whole life. Nor was it only his mother who so loved him. All his comrades at the high school and the university not merely liked him very much, but respected him. He had this effect on all who met him. It was impossible not to believe what he said, impossible to suspect any deception or falseness in one who had such an open, honest face, and in particular, such eyes. In general, his personality helped him much in his affairs. A creditor who would have refused another trusted him. The clerk, the village elder, or a peasant who would have played a dirty trick and cheated someone else forgot to deceive under the pleasant impression of intercourse with this kindly, agreeable, and above all candid man. It was the end of May. Eugene had somehow managed in town to get the vacant land freed from the mortgage, so as to sell it to a merchant, and had borrowed money from that same merchant to replenish his stock, that is to say, to procure horses, bulls, carts, and chiefly, to begin to build a necessary farmhouse. The matter had been arranged. The timber was being carted, the carpenters were already at work, and manure for the estate was being brought on eighty carts. But everything still hung by a thread. 2. Amid these cares, something came about which, though unimportant, tormented Eugene at the time. As a young man, he had lived as all healthy young men live, 
That is, he had had relations with women of various kinds. He was not a libertine, but, as he himself said, neither was he a monk. He only turned to this, however, in so far as was necessary for physical health and to have his mind free, as he used to say. This had begun when he was sixteen and had gone on satisfactorily. Satisfactorily in the sense that he did not give himself up to debauchery, was not once infatuated, and had never contracted a disease. At first he had a seamstress in Petersburg, then she got spoilt, and he made other arrangements, and that side of his affairs was so well secured that it did not trouble him. But now he was living in the country for the second month, and did not at all know what he was to do. Compulsory self-restraint was beginning to have a bad effect on him. Must he really go to town for that purpose? And where to? How? That was the only thing that disturbed Eugene Ivanich. But as he was convinced that the thing was necessary, and that he needed it, it really became necessary, and he felt that he was not free, and that involuntarily his eyes followed every young woman. He did not approve of having relations with a married woman or a maid in his own village. He knew by report that both his father and grandfather had been quite different in this matter from other landowners of that time. At home, they had never had any entanglements with peasant women, and he had decided that he would not do so either. But afterwards, feeling himself ever more and more under compulsion, and imagining with horror what might happen to him in the neighbouring country town, and reflecting on the fact that the days of serfdom were now over, he decided that it might be done on the spot. Only it must be done so that no one should know of it, and not for the sake of debauchery, but merely for health's sake, as he said to himself. And when he had decided this, he became still more restless. When talking to the village elder, the peasants or the carpenters, he involuntarily brought the conversation round to women, and when it turned to women, he kept it on that theme. He noticed the women more and more. 3. To settle the matter in his own mind was one thing, but to carry it out was another. To approach a woman himself was impossible. Which one? Where? It must be done through someone else, but to whom should he speak about it? He happened to go into a watchman's hut in the forest to get a drink of water. The watchman had been his father's huntsman. Eugene Ivanich chatted with him, and the watchman began telling some strange tales of hunting sprees. It occurred to Eugene Ivanich that it would be convenient to arrange matters in this hut or in the wood. Only he did not know how to manage it, and whether old Daniel would undertake the arrangement. Perhaps he will be horrified at such a proposal and I shall have disgraced myself, but perhaps he would agree to it quite simply. So he thought, while listening to Daniel's stories. Daniel was telling how once, when they had been stopping at the hut of the sexton's wife in an outlying field, he had brought a woman for Fedor Zakharish Pryanishnikov. It will be all right, thought Eugene. Your father, may the kingdom of heaven be his, did not go in for nonsense of that kind. It won't do thought Eugene. But to test the matter, he said, how was it you engaged on such bad things? But what is there bad in it? She was glad of it, and Fedor Zakharich was satisfied, very satisfied. I got a rouble. Why, what was he to do? He too is a lively limb, apparently, and drinks wine. Yes, I may speak, thought Eugene, and at once proceeded to do so. And do you know, Daniel, I don't know how to endure it. He felt himself going scarlet. Daniel smiled. I am not a monk. I have been accustomed to it. He felt that what he was saying was stupid, but was glad to see that Daniel approved. Why, of course, you should have told me long ago. It can all be arranged, said he. Only tell me which one you want. Oh, it is really all the same to me. Of course not an ugly one, and she must be healthy. I understand, said Daniel briefly he reflected. Ah, there is a tasty morsel, he began. Again, Eugene went red. A tasty morsel. See here, she was married last autumn, Daniel whispered, and he hasn't been able to do anything. Think what that is worth to one who wants it. Eugene even frowned with shame. No, no, he said. I don't want that at all. 
I want, on the contrary, what could the contrary be? On the contrary, I only want that she should be healthy and that there should be as little fuss as possible, a woman whose husband is away in the army or something of that kind. I know, it's Stepanida I must bring you. Her husband is away in town, just the same as a soldier, and she is a fine woman and clean. You will be satisfied. As it is, I was saying to her the other day, you should go, but she... Well then, when is it to be? Tomorrow, if you like. I shall be going to get some tobacco and I will call in, and at the dinner hour come here or to the bathhouse behind the kitchen garden. There will be nobody about. Besides, after dinner, everybody takes a nap. All right, then. A terrible excitement seized Eugene as he rode home. What will happen? What is a peasant woman like? Suppose it turns out that she is hideous, horrible. No, she is handsome, he told himself, remembering some he had been noticing. But what shall I say? What shall I do? He was not himself all that day. Next day at noon, he went to the forester's hut. Daniel stood at the door and silently and significantly nodded towards the wood. The blood rushed to Eugene's heart. He was conscious of it and went to the kitchen garden. No one was there. He went to the bathhouse. There was no one about. He looked in, came out, and suddenly heard the crackling of a breaking twig. He looked round, and she was standing in the thicket beyond the little ravine. He rushed there across the ravine. There were nettles in it, which he had not noticed. They stung him, and losing the pince-nez from his nose, he ran up the slope on the farther side. In a white embroidered apron, in a red-brown skirt, and a bright red kerchief, barefoot, fresh, firm and handsome, she stood shyly smiling. There is a path leading round. You should have gone round, she said. I came long ago, ever so long. He went up to her, and looking her over, touched her. A quarter of an hour later they separated. He found his pince-nez, called in to see Daniel, and in reply to his question, Are you satisfied, master? Gave him a rouble and went home. He was satisfied. Only at first had he felt ashamed, then it had passed off, and it had all gone well. The best thing was that he now felt at ease, tranquil and vigorous. As for her, he had not even seen her thoroughly. He remembered that she was clean, fresh, not bad-looking and simple, without any pretense. Whose wife is she? said he to himself. Pechnikov's, Daniel said. What Pechnikov is that? There are two households of that name. Probably she is old Michael's daughter-in-law. Yes, that must be it. His son does live in Moscow. I'll ask Daniel about it some time. From then onward, that previously important drawback to country life, enforced self-restraint, was eliminated. Eugene's freedom of mind was no longer disturbed, and he was able to attend freely to his affairs. And the matter Eugene had undertaken was far from easy. It sometimes seemed to him that he would not be able to go through with it, and that it would end in his having to sell the estate after all, so that all his efforts would be wasted, and it would turn out that he had failed and been unable to accomplish what he had undertaken. That prospect disturbed him most of all. Before he had time to stop up one hole, a new one would unexpectedly show itself. All this time more and more debts of his father's, which he had not expected, came to light. It was evident that his father had latterly borrowed right and left. At the time of the settlement in May, Eugene had thought he at last knew everything. But suddenly, in the middle of the summer, he received a letter from which it appeared that there was still a debt of 12,000 roubles to the widow Esipova. There was no promissory note, but only an ordinary receipt, which his lawyer told him could be disputed. But it did not enter Eugene's head to refuse to pay a debt of his father's merely because the document could be challenged. He only wanted to know for certain whether there had been such a debt. Mama, who is Kaleria Vladimirovna Esipova? he asked his mother when they met as usual for dinner. Esipova, she was brought up by your grandfather. Why? Eugene told his mother about the letter. I wonder she is not ashamed to ask for it. Your father gave her so much. But do we owe her this? Well now, how shall I say? It is not a debt, papa, out of his unbounded kindness. 
Yes, but did Papa consider it a debt? I cannot say, I don't know. I only know it is hard enough for you without that. Eugene saw that Mary Pavlovna did not know what to say and was as it were sounding him. I see from what you say that it must be paid, said the son. I will go to see her tomorrow and have a chat and see if it cannot be deferred. Ah, how sorry I am for you, but, you know, that will be best. Tell her she must wait, said Mary Pavlovna, evidently tranquilized and proud of her son's decision. Eugene's position was particularly hard, because his mother, who was living with him, did not at all realize his position. She had been so accustomed all her life long to live extravagantly that she could not even imagine to herself the position her son was in, that is to say, that today or tomorrow matters might shape themselves so that they would have nothing left, and he would have to sell everything and live and support his mother on what salary he could earn, which at the very most would be two thousand roubles. She did not understand that they could only save themselves from that position by cutting down expense in everything, and so she could not understand why Eugene was so careful about trifles, in expenditure on gardeners, coachmen, servants, even on food. Also, like most widows, she nourished feelings of devotion to the memory of her departed spouse quite different from those she had felt for him while he lived, and she did not admit the thought that what the departed had done, or had arranged, could be wrong or could be altered. Eugene, by great efforts, managed to keep up the garden and the conservatory with two gardeners and the stables with two coachmen, and Mary Pavlovna naively thought that she was sacrificing herself for her son and doing all a mother could do by not complaining of the food which the old man-cook prepared, of the fact that the paths in the park were not all swept clean, and that instead of footmen they had only a boy. So too, concerning this new debt, in which Eugene saw an almost crushing blow to all his undertakings, Mary Pavlovna only saw an incident displaying Eugene's noble nature. Mary Pavlovna, moreover, did not feel much anxiety about Eugene's position, because she was confident that he would make a brilliant marriage which would put everything right. And he could make a very brilliant marriage. She knew a dozen families who would be glad to give their daughters to him, and she wished to arrange the matter as soon as possible. 4. Eugene himself dreamt of marriage, but not in the same way as his mother. The idea of using marriage as a means of putting his affairs in order was repulsive to him. He wished to marry honorably for love. He observed the girls whom he met, and those. He knew and compared himself with them, but no decision had yet been taken. Meanwhile, contrary to his expectations, his relations with Stepanida continued, and even acquired the character of a settled affair. Eugene was so far from debauchery, it was so hard for him secretly to do this thing which he felt to be bad, that he could not arrange these meetings himself, and even after the first one hoped not to see Stepanida again. But it turned out that after some time the same restlessness, due, he believed, to that cause, again overcame him. And his restlessness this time was no longer impersonal, but suggested just those same bright, black eyes, and that deep voice, saying, ever so long, that same scent of something fresh and strong, and that same full bread lifting the bib of her apron, and all this in that hazel and maple thicket, bathed in bright sunlight. Though he felt ashamed, he again approached Daniel, and again a rendezvous was fixed for midday, in the wood. This time, Eugene looked her over more carefully, and everything about her seemed attractive. He tried talking to her, and asked about her husband. He really was Michael's son, and lived as a coachman in Moscow. Well then, how is it you? Eugene wanted to ask how it was she was untrue to him. What about how is it? asked she. Evidently, she was clever and quick-witted. Well, how is it you come to me? There now, said she merrily. I bet he goes on the spree there. Why shouldn't I? Evidently, she was putting on an air of sauciness and assurance, and this seemed charming to Eugene. But all the same, he did not himself fix a rendezvous with her. Even when she proposed that they should meet without the aid of Daniel, to whom she seemed not very well disposed, 
Eugene did not consent. He hoped that this meeting would be the last. He liked her. He thought such intercourse was necessary for him and that there was nothing bad about it, but in the depth of his soul there was a stricter judge who did not approve of it and hoped that this would be the last time, or if he did not hope that, at any rate, did not wish to participate in arrangements to repeat it another time. So the whole summer passed, during which they met a dozen times and always by Daniel's help. It happened once that she could not be there because her husband had come home, and Daniel proposed another woman, but Eugene refused with disgust. Then the husband went away, and the meetings continued as before, at first through Daniel, but afterwards he simply fixed the time, and she came with another woman, Prokhorova, as it would not do for a peasant woman to go about alone. Once at the very time fixed for the rendezvous, a family came to call on Mary Pavlovna with the very girl she wished Eugene to marry, and it was impossible for Eugene to get away. As soon as he could do so, he went out as though to the thrashing floor and round by the path to their meeting place in the wood. She was not there, but at the accustomed spot everything within reach of one's hand had been broken, the black alder, the hazel twigs, and even a young maple the thickness of a stake. She had waited, had become excited and angry, and had skittishly left him a remembrance. He waited, waited, and went to Daniel to ask him to call her for tomorrow. She came, and was just as usual. So the summer passed. The meetings were always arranged in the wood, and only once, when it grew towards autumn, in the shed that stood in her backyard. It did not enter Eugene's head that these relations of his had any importance for him. About her he did not even think. He gave her money and nothing more. At first he did not know and did not think that the affair was known and she was envied throughout the village, or that her relations took money from her and encouraged her, and that her conception of any sin in the matter had been quite obliterated by the influence of the money and her family's approval. It seemed to her that if people envied her, then what she was doing was good. It is simply necessary for one's health, thought Eugene. I grant it is not right, and though no one says anything, everybody or many people know of it. The woman who comes with her knows, and once she knows, she is sure to have told others. But what's to be done? I am acting badly, thought Eugene. But what's one to do? Anyhow, it is not for long. What chiefly disturbed Eugene was the thought of the husband. At first, for some reason, it seemed to him that the husband must be a poor sort, and this, as it were, partly justified his conduct. But he saw the husband and was struck. He was a fine fellow and smartly dressed, in no way a worse man, but surely better than himself. At their next meeting, he told her he had seen her husband and had been surprised to see that he was such a fine fellow. There's not such another in the village, said she proudly. This surprised Eugene. The thought of the husband tormented him still more after that. He happened to be at Daniel's one day, and Daniel, having begun chatting, plainly said to him, And Michael the other day asked me, Is it true that the master is living with my wife? I said I did not know. Anyway, I said, better with the master than with a peasant. Well, and what did he say? He said, wait a bit, I'll get to know, and I'll give it her all the same. Yes, if the husband returned to live here, I would give her up, thought Eugene. But the husband lived in town, and for the present their intercourse continued. When necessary, I will break it off, and there will be nothing left of it, thought he. And this seemed to him certain, especially as during the whole summer many different things occupied him very fully the erection of the new farmhouse, and the harvest, and building, and above all meeting the debts and selling the wasteland. All these were affairs that completely absorbed him, and on which he spent his thoughts when he lay down and when he rose. All that was real life. His intercourse, he did not even call it connection, with Stepanida was something quite unnoticed, it is true that when the wish to see her arose, it came with such strength that he could think of nothing else. But this did not last long. A meeting was arranged, and he again forgot her for a week or even for a month. 
In autumn, Eugene often rode to town, and they became friendly with the Anenskis. They had a daughter who had just finished the institute. And then, to Mary Pavlovna's great grief, it happened that Eugene, as she expressed it, cheapened himself by falling in love with Lisa Aninskaya and proposing to her. From that time, the relations with Stepanida ceased. 5. It is impossible to explain why Eugene chose Liza Aninskaya, as it is never possible to explain why a man chooses this and not that woman. There were many reasons, positive and negative. One reason was that she was not a very rich heiress such as his mother sought for him, another that she was naive and to be pitied in her relations with her mother, then there was the fact that she was not a beauty who attracted general attention to herself, but yet was not bad-looking. The chief reason was that his acquaintance with her began at the time when Eugene was ripe for marriage. He fell in love because he knew that he would marry. Liza Aninskaya was at first merely pleasing to Eugene, but when he decided to make her his wife, his feelings for her became much stronger. He felt that he was in love. Liza was tall, slender, and long. Everything about her was long, her face and her nose, not prominently but downwards, and her fingers and her feet. The color of her face was very delicate, yellowish-white and delicately pink. Her hair was long, light brown, soft, curly, and she had beautiful, clear, mild, confiding eyes. Those eyes especially struck Eugene, and when he thought of Liza, he always saw those clear, mild, confiding eyes. Such was she physically. Spiritually, he knew nothing of her, but only saw those eyes, and those eyes seemed to tell him all he needed to know. The meaning of those eyes was this. While still in the institute, when she was fifteen, Liza used continually to fall in love with all attractive men and was animated and happy only when she was in love. After leaving the institute, she continued to fall in love, in just the same way, with all the young men she met, and of course fell in love with Eugene as soon as she made his acquaintance. It was this being in love which gave her eyes that particular expression which so captivated Eugene. Already that winter she had been, at one and the same time, in love with two young men, and blushed and became excited not only when they entered the room, but whenever their names were mentioned. But afterwards, when her mother hinted to her that Irtenev seemed to have serious intentions, her love for him increased so that she became almost indifferent to the two previous attractions, and when Irtenev began to come to their balls and parties, and danced with her more than with others, and evidently only wished to know whether she loved him, her love for him became painful. She dreamed of him in her sleep, and seemed to see him when she was awake in a dark room, and everyone else vanished from her mind. But when he proposed and they were formally engaged, and when they had kissed one another and were a betrothed couple, then she had no thoughts but of him, no desire but to be with him, to love him, and to be loved by him. She was also proud of him, and felt emotional about him, and herself, and her love, and quite melted, and felt faint from love of him. The more he got to know her, the more he loved her. He had not at all expected to find such love, and it strengthened his own feelings still more. 6. Towards spring, he went to his estate at Semenovsko to have a look at it, and to give directions about the management and especially about the house which was being done up for his wedding. Mary Pavlovna was dissatisfied with her son's choice, not only because the match was not as brilliant as it might have been, but also because she did not like Varvara Alexeevna, his future mother-in-law. Whether she was good-natured or not, she did not know and could not decide, but that she was not well-bred, not comme il faut, not a lady, as Mary Pavlovna said to herself. She saw from their first acquaintance, and this distressed her. Distressed her because she was accustomed to value breeding, and knew that Eugene was sensitive to it, and she foresaw that he would suffer much annoyance on this account. But she liked the girl, liked her chiefly because Eugene did. One could not help loving her, and Mary Pavlovna was quite sincerely ready to do so. Eugene found his mother contented and in good spirits. 
She was getting everything straight in the house and preparing to go away herself as soon as he brought his young wife. Eugene persuaded her to stay for the time being, and the future remained undecided. In the evening after tea, Mary Pavlovna played patience as usual. Eugene sat by, helping her. This was the hour of their most intimate talks. Having finished one game of patience, and while preparing to begin another, Mary Pavlovna looked up at Eugene, and with a little hesitation, began thus. I wanted to tell you, Genya, of course I do not know, but in general I wanted to suggest to you that before your wedding it is absolutely necessary to have finished with all your bachelor affairs, so that nothing may disturb either you or your wife. God forbid that it should. You understand me? And indeed Eugene at once understood that Mary Pavlovna was hinting at his relations with Stepanida, which had ended in the previous autumn and that she attributed much more importance to those relations than they deserved, as single women always do. Eugene blushed, and not from shame so much as from vexation, that good-natured Mary Pavlovna was bothering, out of affection, no doubt, but still was bothering about matters that were not her business, and that she did not and could not understand. He answered that he had nothing that needed concealment, and that he had always conducted himself so that there should be nothing to hinder his marrying. Well, dear, that is excellent. Only Genya, don't be vexed with me, said Mary Pavlovna in confusion. But Eugene saw that she had not finished and had not said what she wanted to. So it appeared when a little later she began to tell him of how, in his absence, she had been asked to stand godmother at the Pechnikovs. Eugene flushed now not with vexation or shame, but with some strange consciousness of the importance of what was about to be told him, an involuntary consciousness quite at variance with his conclusions. And what he expected happened. Mary Pavlovna, as if merely by way of conversation, mentioned that this year only boys were being born, evidently a sign of a coming war. Both at the Vassins and the Pechnikovs the young wife had a first child, at each house a boy. Mary Pavlovna wanted to say this casually, but she herself felt ashamed when she saw the colour mount to her son's face and saw him nervously removing, tapping, and replacing his pince-nez and hurriedly lighting a cigarette. She became silent. He, too, was silent, and could not think how to break that silence. So they both understood that they had understood one another. Yes. The chief thing is that there should be justice and no favoritism in the village, as under your grandfather. Mama, said Eugene suddenly, I know why you are saying this. You have no need to be disturbed. My future family life is so sacred to me that I should not infringe it in any case. And as to what occurred in my bachelor days, that is quite ended. I never formed any union, and no one has any claims on me. Well, I am glad, said his mother. I know how noble your feelings are. Eugene accepted his mother's words as a tribute due to him and did not reply. Next day he drove to town thinking of his fiancée and of anything in the world except of Stepanida. But, as if purposely to remind him, on approaching the church he met people walking and driving back from it. He met old Matvey with Simon, some lads and girls, and then two women one elderly, the other smartly dressed with a bright red kerchief, who seemed familiar. The woman was walking lightly, boldly, carrying a child in her arms. He came up to them, the elder woman bowed, stopping in the old-fashioned way, but the young woman with the child only bent her head, and from under the kerchief gleamed familiar, merry, smiling eyes. Yes, this was she, but all was over, and it was no use looking at her. And the child may be mine, flashed through his mind. No, what nonsense. There was her husband, she used to see him. He did not even consider the matter further, so settled in his mind was it that it had been necessary for his health. He had paid her money, and there was no more to be said. There was, there had been, and there could be, no question of any union between them. It was not that he stifled the voice of conscience, no, his conscience simply said nothing to him, and he thought no more about her after the conversation with his mother and after this meeting. 
nor did he meet her again. Eugene was married in town the week after Easter and left at once with his young wife for his country estate. The house had been arranged as usual for a young couple. Mary Pavlovna wished to leave, but Eugene and still more strongly Liza begged her to remain, and she only moved into a detached wing of the house. And so a new life began for Eugene. Seven. The first year of his marriage was a hard one for Eugene. It was hard because affairs he had managed to put off during the time of his courtship now, after his marriage, all came upon him at once. To escape from debts was impossible. An outlying part of the estate was sold, and the most pressing obligations met. But others remained, and he had no money. The estate yielded a good revenue, but he had had to send payments to his brother and to spend on his own marriage, so that there was no ready money and the factory could not carry on and would have to be closed down. The only way of escape was to use his wife's money. Liza, having realized her husband's position, insisted on this herself. Eugene agreed, but only on condition that he should give her a mortgage on half his estate, and this he did. Of course, it was not for the sake of his wife, who felt offended at it, but to appease his mother-in-law. These affairs, with various fluctuations of success and failure, helped to poison Eugene's life that first year. Another thing was his wife's ill health. That same first year, seven months after their marriage in autumn, a misfortune befell Liza. She drove out to meet her husband who was returning from town. The quiet horse became rather playful and she was frightened and jumped out. Her jump was comparatively fortunate. She might have been caught by the wheel, but she was pregnant, and that same night the pains began, and she had a miscarriage from which she was long in recovering. The loss of the expected child and his wife's illness, together with the disorder in his affairs, and above all the presence of his mother-in-law, who arrived as soon as Liza fell ill, all this together made the year still harder for Eugene. But notwithstanding these difficult circumstances, towards the end of the first year, Eugene felt very well. First of all, his cherished hope of restoring his fallen fortune and renewing his grandfather's way of life in a new form was approaching accomplishment, though slowly and with difficulty. There was no longer any question of having to sell the whole estate to meet the debts. The chief estate, though transferred to his wife's name, was saved and if only the beet crop succeeded and the price kept up, by next year his position of want and stress might be replaced by one of complete prosperity. That was one thing. Another was that however much he had expected from his wife, he had never expected to find in her what he actually found. It was not what he had expected, but it was much better. Emotion, raptures of love, though he tried to produce them, did not take place or were very slight but something quite different appeared, namely, that he was not merely more cheerful and happier, but that it became easier to live. He did not know why this should be so, but it was. It happened because immediately after the marriage she decided that Eugene Irtenev was superior to, wiser, purer, and nobler than anyone else in the world, and therefore it was right for everyone to serve him and do what would please him. But as it was impossible to make everyone do this, she, to the limit of her strength, must do it herself. So she did, and therefore all her strength of mind was directed towards learning and guessing what he liked, and then doing just that, whatever it was, and however difficult it might be. She had the gift which furnishes the chief delight of intercourse with a loving woman. Thanks to her love of her husband, she penetrated into his soul. She knew better it seemed to him than he himself, his every state and every shade of his feeling, and she behaved correspondingly, and therefore never hurt his feelings, but always lessened his distresses and strengthened his joys. And she understood not only his feelings, but also his joys. Things quite foreign to her, concerning the farming, the factory, or the appraisement of others, she immediately understood so that she could not merely converse with him, but could often as he himself said, be a useful and irreplaceable counsellor. She regarded affairs and people and everything in the world only through his eyes. She loved her mother, 
but having seen that Eugene disliked his mother-in-law's interference in their life, she immediately took her husband's side, and did so with such decision that he had to restrain her. Besides all this, she had very much taste, tact, and above all, peacefulness. All that she did, she did unnoticed. Only the results of what she did were observable, namely, that always and in everything there was cleanliness, order, and elegance. Liza had at once understood in what her husband's ideal of life consisted, and she tried to attain, and in the arrangement and order of the house did attain, what he wanted. Children, it is true, were lacking, but there was hope of this also. In winter, she went to Petersburg to see a specialist, and he assured them that she was quite well and could have children. And this desire was accomplished. By the end of the year, she was again pregnant. The one thing that threatened, not to say poisoned, their happiness was her jealousy, a jealousy she restrained and did not exhibit, but from which she often suffered. Not only might Eugene not love anyone, because there was not a woman on earth worthy of him, as to whether she herself was worthy or not, she never asked herself, but not a single woman might therefore dare to love him. 8. They lived thus. He rose, as he always had done, early, and went to see to the farm or the factory where work was going on, or sometimes to the fields. Towards ten o'clock he would come back to his coffee. They had it on the veranda, Mary Pavlovna, an uncle who lived with them, and Liza. After a conversation which was often very animated while they drank their coffee, they dispersed till dinner time. At two o'clock they dined and then went for a walk or a drive. In the evening, when he returned from his office, they drank their evening tea, and sometimes he read aloud while she worked, or when there were guests, they had music or talked. When he went away on business, he wrote to his wife, and received letters from her every day. Sometimes she accompanied him, and then they were particularly merry. On his name day and on hers guests assembled, and it was pleasant to him to see how well she managed to arrange things so that it was pleasant for everybody. He saw and heard also that they all admired her, the young, agreeable hostess, and he loved her still more for this. All went excellently. She bore her pregnancy easily, and though they were afraid, they both began making plans as to how they would bring the child up. The system of education and the arrangements were all decided by Eugene, and her only wish was obediently to carry out his desires. Eugene, on his part, read up medical works and intended to bring the child up according to all the precepts of science. She, of course, agreed to everything and made preparations, making warm and also cool envelopes and preparing a cradle. Thus the second year of their marriage arrived and the second spring. 9. It was just before Trinity Sunday. Liza was in her fifth month and though careful, she was brisk and active. Both the mothers, his and hers, were living in the house, but under pretext of watching and safeguarding her, only upset her by their tiffs. Eugene was specially engrossed with a new experiment for the cultivation of sugar beet on a large scale. Just before Trinity Liza decided that it was necessary to have a thorough house cleaning, as it had not been done since Easter, and she hired two women by the day to help the servants wash the floors and windows, beat the furniture and the carpets, and put covers on them. The women came early in the morning, heated the coppers, and set to work. One of the two was Stepanida, who had just weaned her baby boy. Through the office clerk, whom she now carried on with, she had begged for the job of washing the floors. She wanted to have a good look at the new mistress. Stepanida was living by herself, as formerly, her husband being away, and she was up to tricks, as she had formerly been first with old Daniel, who had once caught her taking some logs of firewood, afterwards with the master, and now with the young clerk. She was not concerning herself any longer about her master. He has a wife now, she thought, but it would be good to have a look at the lady and at her establishment. Folk said it was well arranged. Eugene had not seen her since he had met her with the child. Having a baby to attend to, she had not been going out to work, and he seldom walked through the village. That morning, on the eve of Trinity Sunday, Eugene rose at five o'clock 
and rode to the fallow land which was to be sprinkled with phosphates, and he left the house before the women were about it, and while they were still engaged, lighting the copper fires. Merry, contented and hungry, Eugene returned to breakfast. He dismounted from his mare at the gate and handed her over to the gardener, flicking the high grass with his whip and repeating, as one often does, a phrase he had just uttered, he walked towards the house. The phrase he repeated was, Phosphates justify, what or to whom he neither knew nor reflected. They were beating a carpet on the grass. The furniture had been brought out. There now, what a house-cleaning Liza has undertaken. Phosphates justify. What a manageress she is. A manageress. Yes, a manageress, said he to himself, vividly imagining her in her white wrapper and with her smiling, joyful face, as it nearly always was when he looked at her. Yes, I must change my boots, or else phosphates justify, that is, smell of manure, and the manageress is in such a condition. Why in such a condition? Because a new little Irtenev is growing there inside her, he thought. Yes, phosphates justify. And smiling at his thoughts, he put his hand to the door of his room. But he had not time to push the door before it opened of itself, and he met, face to face, a woman coming towards him carrying a pail, barefoot, and with sleeves turned up high, he stepped aside to let her pass. She too stepped aside, adjusting her kerchief with a wet hand. Go on, go on, I won't go there if you... began Eugene, and suddenly, recognizing her, stopped. She glanced merrily at him with smiling eyes, and pulling down her skirt went out by the door. What nonsense! It is impossible, said Eugene to himself, frowning and waving his hand as though to get rid of a fly, displeased at having noticed her. He was vexed that he had noticed her, and yet he could not take his eyes from her strong body, swayed by the agile strides of her bare feet, or from her arms, shoulders, and the pleasing folds of her shirt and handsome skirt, tucked up high above her white calves. But why am I looking? said he to himself, lowering his eyes so as not to see her. But anyhow, I must go in to get some other boots and he turned back to go into his own room, but had not gone five steps before. Without knowing why or wherefore, he again glanced round to have another look at her. She was just going round the corner, and also glanced at him. Ah, what am I doing? said he to himself. She may think. It is even certain that she already does think. He entered his damp room. Another woman, an old and skinny one, was there, and was still washing it. Eugene passed on tiptoe across the floor, wet with dirty water to the wall where his boots stood, and he was about to leave the room when the woman herself went out. This one has gone, and the other, Stepanida, will come here alone, someone within him began to reflect. My God, what am I thinking of and what am I doing? He seized his boots and ran out with them into the hall, put them on there, brushed himself, and went out onto the veranda where both the mamas were already drinking coffee. Liza had evidently been expecting him and came on to the veranda through another door at the same time. My God! If she, who considers me so honourable, pure and innocent, if she only knew, thought he. Liza, as usual, met him with shining face, but today somehow she seemed to him particularly pale, yellow, long and weak. Ten. During coffee, as often happened, a peculiarly feminine kind of conversation went on which had no logical sequence, but which evidently was connected in some way, for it went on uninterruptedly. The two old ladies were pinpricking one another, and Liza was skillfully manoeuvring between them. I am so vexed that we had not finished washing your room before you got back, she said to her husband, but I do so want to get everything arranged. Well, did you sleep well after I got up? Yes, I slept well, and I feel well. How can a woman be well in her condition during this intolerable heat when her windows face the sun, said Vavara Alexeevna, her mother, and they have no Venetian blinds or awnings. I always had awnings. But you know we are in the shade after ten o'clock, said Mary Pavlovna. That's what causes fever, 
it comes of dampness, said Varvara Alexevna, not noticing that what she was saying did not agree with what she had just said. My doctor always says that it is impossible to diagnose an illness unless one knows the patient. And he certainly knows, for he is the leading physician, and we pay him a hundred roubles a visit. My late husband did not believe in doctors, but he did not grudge me anything. How can a man grudge anything to a woman when perhaps her life and the child's depend? Yes, when she has means, a wife need not depend on her husband. A good wife submits to her husband, said Vavara Alexeyevna. Only Liza is too weak after her illness. Oh no, Mama, I feel quite well. But why have they not brought you any boiled cream? I don't want any. I can do with raw cream. I offered some to Varvara Alexeyevna, but she declined, said Mary Pavlovna, as if justifying herself. No, I don't want any today. And as if to terminate an unpleasant conversation and yield magnanimously, Varvara Alexeyevna turned to Eugene and said, Well, and have you sprinkled the phosphates? Liza ran to fetch the cream. But I don't want it. I don't want it. Liza, Liza, go gently, said Mary Pavlovna. Such rapid movements do her harm. Nothing does harm if one's mind is at peace, said Varvara Alexeyevna, as if referring to something, though she knew that there was nothing that her words could refer to. Liza returned with the cream. Eugene drank his coffee and listened morosely. He was accustomed to these conversations, but today he was particularly annoyed by its lack of sense. He wanted to think over what had happened to him, but this chatter disturbed him. Having finished her coffee, Varvara Alexeyevna went away in a bad humour. Lisa, Eugene and Mary Pavlovna stayed behind, and their conversation was simple and pleasant. But Liza, being sensitive, at once noticed that something was tormenting Eugene, and she asked him whether anything unpleasant had happened. He was not prepared for this question, and hesitated a little before replying that there had been nothing unpleasant, and this reply made Liza think all the more that something was tormenting, and greatly tormenting, him was as evident to her as the fact that a fly had fallen into the milk, yet he did not speak of it. What could it be? 11. After breakfast, they all dispersed. Eugene, as usual, went to his study. He did not begin reading or writing his letters, but sat smoking one cigarette after another and thinking. He was terribly surprised and disturbed by the expected recrudescence within him of the bad feeling from which he had thought himself free since his marriage. Since then he had not once experienced that feeling, either for her, the woman he had known, or for any other woman except his wife. He had often felt glad of this emancipation, and now suddenly a chance meeting, seemingly so unimportant, revealed to him the fact that he was not free. What now tormented him was not that he was yielding to that feeling and desired her. He did not dream of so doing, but that the feeling was awake within him, and he had to be on his guard against it. He had no doubt, but that he would suppress it. He had a letter to answer and a paper to write. He sat down at his writing table and began to work. Having finished it and quite forgotten what had disturbed him, he went out to go to the stables. And again, as ill luck would have it, either by unfortunate chance or intentionally, as soon as he stepped from the porch, a red skirt and red kerchief appeared from round the corner, and she went past him, swinging her arms and swaying her body. She not only went past him, but on passing him ran, as if playfully, to overtake her fellow servant. Again the bright midday, the nettles, the back of Daniel's hut, and in the shade of the plane trees her smiling face biting some leaves rose in his imagination. No, it is impossible to let matters continue so, he said to himself, and waiting till the women had passed out of sight, he went to the office. It was just the dinner hour, and he hoped to find the steward still there. So it happened. The steward was just waking up from his after-dinner nap. Standing in the office, stretching himself and yawning, he was looking at the herdsman who was telling him something. Vasily Nikolaich, said Eugene to the steward, what is your pleasure? I want to speak to you. What is your pleasure? Just finish what you're saying. Aren't you going to bring it in? said Vasily Nikolaich to the herdsman.
It's heavy, Vasily Nikolaik. What is it? asked Eugene. Why, a cow has calved in the meadow. Well, all right, I'll order them to harness a horse at once. Tell Nicholas Lysuk to get out the dray cart. The herdsman went out. Do you know, began Eugene, flushing and conscious that he was doing so. Do you know, Vasily Nikolaich, while I was a bachelor, I went off the track a bit. You may have heard. Vasily Nikolaich, with smiling eyes and evidently sorry for his master, said, Is it about Stepanida? Why, yes, look here, please, please do not engage her to help in the house. You understand, it is very awkward for me. Yes, it must have been Vanya, the clerk, who arranged it. Yes, please. Well, and hadn't the rest of the phosphates better be strewn, said Eugene to hide his confusion. Yes, I am just going to see to it. So it ended. And Eugene calmed down, hoping that as he had lived for a year without seeing her, so things would go on now. Besides, Vasily Nikolaik will speak to Ivan the clerk. Ivan will speak to her, and she will understand that I don't want it, said Eugene to himself, and he was glad that he had forced himself to speak to Vasily Nikolaik, hard as it had been to do so. Yes, it is better, better than that feeling of doubt, that feeling of shame. He shuddered at the mere remembrance of his sin in thought. Twelve. The moral effort he had made to overcome his shame and speak to Vasily Nikolaich tranquilized Eugene. It seemed to him that the matter was all over now. Liza at once noticed that he was quite calm and even happier than usual. No doubt he was upset by our mothers pinpricking one another. It really is disagreeable, especially for him who is so sensitive and noble, always to hear such unfriendly and ill-mannered insinuations, thought she. The next day was Trinity Sunday. The weather was beautiful, and the peasant women, according to custom, on their way into the woods to plate wreaths, came to the landowner's home and began to sing and dance. Mary Pavlovna and Vavara Alexevna came out onto the porch in smart clothes, carrying sunshades, and went up to the ring of singers. With them, in a jacket of Chinese silk, came out the uncle a flabby libertine and drunkard who was living that summer with Eugene. As usual, there was a bright, many-coloured ring of young women and girls, the centre of everything, and around these from different sides like attendant planets that had detached themselves and were circling round went girls hand in hand, rustling in their new print gowns. Young lads giggling and running backwards and forwards after one another. Full-grown lads in dark blue or black coats and caps and with red shirts, who unceasingly spat out sunflower seed shells, and the domestic servants or other outsiders watching the dance circle from a side. Both the old ladies went close up to the ring, and Liza accompanied them in a light blue dress, with light blue ribbons on her head, and with wide sleeves under which her long white arms and angular elbows were visible. Eugene did not wish to come out, but it was ridiculous to hide, and he too came out onto the porch smoking a cigarette, bowed to the men and lads, and talked with one of them. The women, meanwhile, shouted a dance song with all their might, snapping their fingers, clapping their hands, and dancing. They are calling for the master, said a youngster, coming up to Eugene's wife, who had not noticed the call. Liza called Eugene to look at the dance, and at one of the women dancers who particularly pleased her. This was Stepanida. She wore a yellow skirt, a velveteen sleeveless jacket, and a silk kerchief, and was broad, energetic, ruddy, and merry. No doubt she danced well. He saw nothing. Yes, yes, said he, removing and replacing his pince-nez. Yes, yes, repeated he. So it seems I cannot be rid of her, he thought. He did not look at her as he was afraid of her attraction, and just on that account what his passing glance caught of her seemed to him especially attractive. Besides this, he saw by her sparkling look that she saw him and saw that he admired her. He stood there as long as propriety demanded, and seeing that Varvara Alexevna had called her, senselessly and insincerely, my dear, and was talking to her, he turned aside and went away. He went into the house. 
He retired in order not to see her, but on reaching the upper story, without knowing how or why, he approached the window, and as long as the women remained at the porch, he stood there and looked and looked at her, feasting his eyes on her. He ran, while there was no one to see him, and then went with quiet steps onto the veranda, and from there, smoking a cigarette, and as if going for a stroll, he passed through the garden and followed the direction she had taken. He had not gone two steps along the alley before he noticed behind the trees a velveteen sleeveless jacket with a pink and yellow skirt and a red kerchief. She was going somewhere with another woman. Where are they going? And suddenly a terrible desire scorched him as though a hand were seizing his heart. As if by someone else's wish he looked round and went towards her. Eugene Ivanich, Eugene Ivanich, I have come to see your honour said a voice behind him, and Eugene, seeing old Samakin, who was digging a well for him, roused himself, and turning quickly round, went to meet Samokin. While speaking with him, he turned sideways and saw that she and the woman who was with her went down the slope, evidently to the well, or making an excuse of the well, and having stopped there a little while, ran back to the dance circle. 13. After talking to Samokin, Eugene returned to the house as depressed as if he had committed a crime. In the first place, she had understood him, believed that he wanted to see her, and desired it herself. Secondly, that other woman, Anna Prokhorova, evidently knew of it. Above all, he felt that he was conquered, that he was not master of his own will, but that there was another power moving him, that he had been saved only by good fortune, and that, if not today, tomorrow, or a day later, he would perish all the same. Yes, perish, he did not understand it otherwise, to be unfaithful to his young and loving wife with a peasant woman in the village, in the sight of everyone, what was it but to perish, perish utterly, so that it would be impossible to live? No, something must be done. My God, my God, what am I to do? Can it be that I shall perish like this? said he to himself. Is it not possible to do anything? Yet something must be done. Do not think about her, he ordered himself. Do not think. And immediately he began thinking and seeing her before him, and seeing also the shade of the plane tree. He remembered having read of a hermit, who to avoid the temptation he felt for a woman on whom he had to lay his hand to heal her, thrust his other hand into a brazier and burnt his fingers. He called that to mind. Yes, I am ready to burn my fingers rather than to perish. He looked round to make sure that there was no one in the room, lit a candle, and put a finger into the flame. They now think about her, he said to himself, ironically. It hurt him, and he withdrew his smoke-stained finger, threw away the match, and laughed at himself. What nonsense! That was not what had to be done. But it was necessary to do something, to avoid seeing her either to go away himself or to send her away. Yes, send her away. Offer her husband money to remove to town or to another village. People would hear of it and would talk about it. Well, what of that? At any rate, it was better than this danger. Yes, that must be done, he said to himself, and at the very time he was looking at her without moving his eyes. Where is she going? he suddenly asked himself. She, as it seemed to him, had seen him at the window, and now, having glanced at him and taken another woman by the hand, was going towards the garden swinging her arm briskly. Without knowing why or wherefore, merely in accord with what he had been thinking, he went to the office. Vasily Nikolaevich, in holiday costume and with oiled hair, was sitting at tea with his wife and a guest, who was wearing an oriental kerchief. I want a word with you, Vasily Nikolaevich. Please say what you want to. We have finished tea. No, I'd rather you came out with me. Directly. Only let me get my cap. Tanya, put out the samovar, said Vasily Nikolaevich, stepping outside cheerfully. It seemed to Eugene that Vasily had been drinking, but what was to be done? It might be all the better. He would sympathize with him in his difficulties the more readily. I have come again to speak about that same matter, Vasily Nikolaevich said Eugene, about that woman. Well, what of her? I told them not to take her again on any account. 
No, I have been thinking in general, and this is what I wanted to take your advice about. Isn't it possible to get them away, to send the whole family away? Where can they be sent? said Vasily, disapprovingly and ironically, as it seemed to Eugene. Well, I thought of giving them money, or even some land in Koltovsky, so that she should not be here. But how can they be sent away? Where is he to go, torn up from his roots, and why should you do it? What harm can she do you? Ah, Vasily Nikolaich, you must understand that it would be dreadful for my wife to hear of it. But who will tell her? How can I live with this dread? The whole thing is very painful for me. But really, why should you distress yourself? Whoever stirs up the past, out with his eye. Who is not a sinner before God and to blame before the Tsar, as the saying is? All the same, it would be better to get rid of them. Can't you speak to the husband? But it is no use speaking. Eh, Eugene Ivanich, what is the matter with you? It is all past and forgotten. All sorts of things happen. Who is there that would now say anything bad of you? Everybody sees you. But all the same, go and have a talk with him. All right, I will speak to him. Though he knew that nothing would come of it, this talk somewhat calmed Eugene. Above all, it made him feel that through excitement he had been exaggerating the danger. Had he gone to meet her by appointment? It was impossible. He had simply gone to stroll in the garden, and she had happened to run out at the same time. 14. After dinner, that very Trinity Sunday Liza, while walking from the garden to the meadow, where her husband wanted to show her the clover, took a full step and fell when crossing a little ditch. She fell gently on her side, but she gave an exclamation, and her husband saw an expression in her face, not only of fear, but of pain. He wished to help her up, but she motioned him away with her hand. No, wait a bit, Eugene, she said, with a weak smile. And as it seemed to him, she looked up guiltily. My foot only gave way under me. There, I always say, remarked Vavara Alexeevna, can anyone in her condition possibly jump over ditches? But no, Mama, it is all right. I shall get up directly. With her husband's help, she did get up, but immediately turned pale, and her face showed fear. Yes, I am not well, and she whispered something to her mother. Oh my God, what have you done? I said you ought not to go there, cried Vavara Alexeevna. Wait, I will call the servants. She must not walk. She must be carried. Don't be afraid, Liza, I will carry you, said Eugene, putting his left arm round her. Hold me by the neck, like that. And stooping down, he put his right arm under her knees and lifted her. He could never afterwards forget the suffering and yet beatific expression of her face. I am too heavy for you, dear, she said with a smile. Mama is running, tell her. And she bent towards him and kissed him. She evidently wanted her mother to see how he was carrying her. Eugene shouted to Varvara Alexeevna not to hurry, and that he would carry Liza home. Vavara Alexeevna stopped and began to shout still louder. You will drop her. You'll be sure to drop her. You want to destroy her. You have no conscience. But I am carrying her excellently. I do not want to watch you killing my daughter, and I can't. And she ran round the bend in the alley. Never mind. It will pass, said Liza, smiling. Yes? If only it does not have consequences like last time. No, I'm not speaking of that. That is all right. I mean, Mama, you are tired. Rest a bit. But though he found it heavy, Eugene carried his burden proudly and gladly to the house and did not hand her over to the housemaid and the man-cook whom Vavara Alexeevna had found and sent to meet them. He carried her to the bedroom and placed her on the bed. Now go away, she said and drawing his hand to her, she kissed it. Anushka and I will manage all right. Mary Pavlovna also ran in from her rooms in the wing. They undressed Liza and laid her on the bed. Eugene sat in the drawing room with a book in his hand, waiting. Vavara Alexeevna went past him with such a reproachfully gloomy air that he felt alarmed. Well, how is it? 
he asked. How? What's the good of asking? It is probably what you wanted when you made your wife jump over the ditch. Varvara Alexeevna, he cried. This is impossible. If you want to torment people and to poison their life, he wanted to say, then go elsewhere to do it. But he restrained himself. How is it that it does not hurt you? It is too late now. And shaking her cap in a triumphant manner, she passed out by the door. The fall had really been a bad one. Liza's foot had twisted awkwardly, and there was danger of her having another miscarriage. Everyone knew that there was nothing to be done, but that she must just lie quietly. Yet all the same, they decided to send for a doctor. Dear Nikolay Semenich, wrote Eugene to the doctor, you have always been so kind to us that I hope you will not refuse to come to my wife's assistance. She, and so on. Having written the letter, he went to the stables to arrange about the horses and the carriage. Horses had to be got ready to bring the doctor, and others to take him back. When an estate is not run on a large scale, such things cannot be quickly decided, but have to be considered. Having arranged it all and dispatched the coachman, it was past nine before he got back to the house. His wife was lying down and said that she felt perfectly well and had no pain, but Varvara Alexeevna was sitting with a lamp screened from Liza by some sheets of music and knitting a large red coverlet with a mean that said that after what had happened, peace was impossible, but that no matter what anyone else did, she at any rate would do her duty. Eugene noticed this, but to appear as if he had not seen it, he tried to assume a cheerful and tranquil air, and told how he had chosen the horses, and how the mare, Kabushka, had galloped capitally as left trace horse in the Troika. Yes, of course, it is just the time to exercise the horses when help is needed. Probably the doctor will also be thrown into the ditch, remarked Varvara Alexeevna, examining her knitting from under her pince-nez and moving it close up to the lamp. But you know we had to send one way or other, and I made the best arrangement I could. Yes, I remember very well how your horses galloped with me under the gateway arch. This was her long-standing fancy, and Eugene now was injudicious enough to remark that was not quite what had happened. It is not for nothing that I have always said and have often remarked to the prince that it is hardest of all to live with people who are untruthful and insincere, I can endure anything except that. Well, if anyone has to suffer more than another, it is certainly I, said Eugene. But you... Yes, it is evident. What? Nothing. I am only counting my stitches. Eugene was standing at the time by the bed, and Liza was looking at him and one of her moist hands outside the coverlet caught his hand and pressed it. Bear with her for my sake. You know she cannot prevent our loving one another, was what her look said. I won't do so again. It's nothing, whispered he, and he kissed her damp, long hand, and then her affectionate eyes, which closed while he kissed them. Can it be the same thing over again? he asked. How are you feeling? I'm afraid to say, for fear of being mistaken, but I feel that he is alive and will live, said she, glancing at her stomach. Ah, it is dreadful, dreadful to think of. Notwithstanding Liza's insistence that he should go away, Eugene spent the night with her, hardly closing an eye and ready to attend on her. But she passed the night well, and had they not sent for the doctor, she would perhaps have got up. By dinner time, the doctor arrived, and of course said that, though if the symptoms recurred, there might be cause for apprehension, yet actually there were no positive symptoms, but as there were also no contrary indications one might suppose on the one hand that, and on the other hand that, and therefore she must lie still, and that, though I do not like prescribing, yet all the same she should take this mixture and should lie quiet. Besides this, the doctor gave Varvara Alexeevna a lecture on woman's anatomy, during which Varvara Alexeevna nodded her head significantly. Having received his fee, as usual, into the backmost part of his palm, the doctor drove away, and the patient was left to lie in bed for a week. 15. Most of his time Eugene spent by his wife's bedside, talking to her, 
reading to her, and what was hardest of all, enduring without murmur Vavara Alexeyevna's attacks, and even contriving to turn these into jokes. But he could not stay at home. In the first place, his wife sent him away, saying that he would fall ill if he always remained with her, and secondly, the farming was progressing in a way that demanded his presence at every step. He could not stay at home, but was in the fields, in the wood, in the garden, at the thrashing floor, and everywhere, not merely the thought, but the vivid image of Stepanida pursued him, and he only occasionally forgot her. But that would not have mattered. He could perhaps have mastered his feeling. But what was worst of all was that, whereas he had previously lived for months without seeing her, he now continually came across her. She evidently understood that he wished to renew relations with her and tried to come in his way. Nothing was said either by him or by her, and therefore neither he nor she went directly to a rendezvous, but only sought opportunities of meeting. The place where it was possible for them to meet each other was in the forest, where peasant women went with sacks to collect grass for their cows. Eugene knew this, and therefore went every day by that wood. Every day he told himself that he would not go there, and every day it ended by his making his way to the forest, and on hearing the sound of voices, standing behind the bushes with sinking heart, looking to see if she was there. Why he wanted to know whether it was she who was there, he did not know. If it had been she and she had been alone, he would not have gone to her, so he believed. He would have run away, but he wanted to see her, once he met her. As he was entering the forest, she came out of it with two other women, carrying a heavy sack full of grass on her back. A little earlier he would perhaps have met her in the forest, but now, with the other women there, she could not go back to him in the forest. But though he realized this impossibility, he stood for a long time, at the risk of attracting the other women's attention, behind a hazel bush. Of course she did not return, but he stayed there a long time. And great heavens, how delightful his imagination made her appear to him, and this not once, but five or six times, and each time more intensely. Never had she seemed so attractive, and never had he been so completely in her power. He felt that he had lost control of himself and had become almost insane. His strictness with himself was not weakened a jot. On the contrary, he saw all the abomination of his desire and even of his action, for his going to the wood was an action. He knew that he only need come near her anywhere in the dark, and if possible touch her, and he would yield to his feelings. He knew that it was only shame before people before her, and no doubt before himself also, that restrained him. And he knew too that he had sought conditions in which that shame would not be apparent, darkness or proximity, in which it would be stifled by animal passion. And therefore he knew that he was a wretched criminal, and despised and hated himself with all his soul. He hated himself because he still had not surrendered. Every day he prayed God to strengthen him, to save him from perishing. Every day he determined that from today onward he would not take a step to see her and would forget her. Every day he devised means of delivering himself from this enticement, and he made use of those means. But it was all in vain. One of the means was continual occupation. Another was intense physical work and fasting. A third was imagining clearly to himself the shame that would fall upon him when everybody knew of it, his wife, his mother-in-law, and the folk around. He did all this, and it seemed to him that he was conquering, but the hour came midday, the hour of their former meetings, and the hour when he had met her carrying the grass, and he went to the forest. Thus, five days of torment passed. He only saw her from a distance, but did not once encounter her. 16. Liza was gradually recovering. She could move about and was only uneasy at the change that had taken place in her husband, which she did not understand. Varvara Alexievna had gone away for a while, and the only visitor was Eugene's uncle. Mary Pavlovna was as usual at home. Eugene was in his semi-insane condition when there came two days of pouring rain, as often happens after thunder in June. The rain stopped all work, 
They even ceased carting manure on account of the dampness and dirt. The peasants remained at home. The herdsmen wore themselves out with the cattle and eventually drove them home. The cows and sheep wandered about in the pasture land and ran loose in the grounds. The peasant women, barefoot and wrapped in shawls, splashing through the mud, rushed about to seek the runaway cows. Streams flowed everywhere along the paths. All the leaves and all the grass were saturated with water, and streams flowed unceasingly from the spouts into the bubbling puddles. Eugene sat at home with his wife, who was particularly wearisome that day. She questioned Eugene several times as to the cause of his discontent, and he replied with vexation that nothing was the matter. She ceased questioning him, but was still distressed. They were sitting after breakfast in the drawing room. His uncle, for the hundredth time, was recounting fabrications about his society acquaintances. Liza was knitting a jacket and sighed, complaining of the weather and of a pain in the small of her back. The uncle advised her to lie down and asked for vodka for himself. It was terribly dull for Eugene in the house. Everything was weak and dull. He read a book and a magazine, but understood nothing of them. Yes, I must go out and look at the rasping machine they brought yesterday, said he. He got up and went out. Take an umbrella with you. Oh, no, I have a leather coat, and I'm only going as far as the boiling room. He put on his boots and his leather coat and went to the factory. But he had not gone twenty steps before. Coming towards him, he met her with her skirts tucked up high above her white calves. She was walking, holding down the shawl in which her head and shoulders were wrapped. Where are you going? said he, not recognizing her the first instant. When he recognized her, it was already too late. She stopped, smiling, and looked long at him. I am looking for a calf. Where are you off to in such weather? said she, as if she were seeing him every day. Come to the shed, said he suddenly, without knowing how he said it. It was as if someone else had uttered the words. She bit her shawl, winked, and ran in the direction which led from the garden to the shed. But he continued his path, intending to turn off beyond the lilac bush and go there too. Master, he heard a voice behind him. The mistress is calling you and wants you to come back for a minute. This was Misha, his manservant. My God, this is the second time you have saved me, thought Eugene, and immediately turned back. His wife reminded him that he had promised to take some medicine at the dinner hour to a sick woman, and he had better take it with him. While they were getting the medicine, some five minutes elapsed, and then, going away with the medicine, he hesitated to go direct to the shed, lest he should be seen from the house. But as soon as he was out of sight, he promptly turned and made his way to it. He already saw her in imagination, inside the shed, smiling gaily. But she was not there and there was nothing in the shed to show that she had been there. He was already thinking that she had not come, had not heard or understood his words. He had muttered them through his nose as if afraid of her hearing them, or perhaps she had not wanted to come. And why did I imagine that she would rush to me? She has her own husband. It is only I who am such a wretch as to have a wife and a good one, and to run after another. Thus, he thought, sitting in the shed, the thatch of which had a leak and dripped from its straw. But how delightful it would be if she did come, alone here in this rain. If only I could embrace her once again, then let happen what may. But yes, he recollected, one could tell if she has been here by her footprints. He looked at the trodden ground near the shed, and at the path overgrown by grass, and the fresh print of bare feet, and even of one that had slipped, was visible. Yes, she has been here. Well, now it is settled. Wherever I may see her, I shall go straight to her. I will go to her at night. He sat for a long time in the shed, and left it exhausted and crushed. He delivered the medicine, returned home, and lay down in his room to wait for dinner. Seventeen. Before dinner, Liza came to him, and still wondering what could be the cause of his discontent, began to say that she was afraid that he did not like the idea of her going to Moscow for her confinement, and that she had decided that she would remain at home and would on no account go to Moscow. 
He knew how she feared both her confinement itself and the risk of not having a healthy child, and therefore he could not help being touched at seeing how ready she was to sacrifice everything for his sake. All was so nice, so pleasant, so clean in the house, and in his soul it was so dirty, despicable, and horrid. The whole evening Eugene was tormented by knowing that notwithstanding his sincere repulsion at his own weakness, notwithstanding his firm intention to break off, the same thing would happen again tomorrow. No, this is impossible, he said to himself, walking up and down in his room. There must be some remedy for it. My God, what am I to do? Someone knocked at the door as foreigners do. He knew this must be his uncle. Come in he said. The uncle had come as a self-appointed ambassador from Liza. Do you know, I really do notice that there is a change in you, he said. And Liza, I understand how it troubles her. I understand that it must be hard for you to leave all the business you have so excellently started, but Kova too. I should advise you to go away. It will be more satisfactory both for you and for her. And do you know, I should advise you to go to the Crimea. The climate is beautiful, and there is an excellent accoucheur there, and you would be just in time for the best of the grape season. Uncle, Eugene suddenly exclaimed, can you keep a secret? A secret that is terrible to me, a shameful secret. Oh, come, do you really feel any doubt of me? Uncle, you can help me, not only help, but save me, said Eugene. And the thought that he would disclose his secret to his uncle, whom he did not respect, the thought that he would show himself in the worst light and humiliate himself before him was pleasant. He felt himself to be despicable and guilty and wished to punish himself. Speak, my dear fellow. You know how fond I am of you, said the uncle, evidently well content that there was a secret and that it was a shameful one and that it would be communicated to him and that he could be of use. First of all, I must tell you that I am a wretch, a good for nothing a scoundrel, a real scoundrel. Now what are you saying? began his uncle, as if he were offended. What? Not a wretch when I, Liza's husband, Liza's. One has only to know her purity, her love, and that I, her husband, want to be untrue to her with a peasant woman. How's that? Why do you want to? You have not been unfaithful to her. Yes, at least just the same as being untrue, for it did not depend on me. I was ready to do so. I was hindered, or else I should. Now, I do not know what I should have done. But please, explain to me. Well, it is like this. When I was a bachelor, I was stupid enough to have relations with a woman here in our village. That is to say, I used to have meetings with her in the forest, in the field. Was she pretty? asked his uncle. Eugene frowned at this question, but he was in such need of external help that he made as if he did not hear it, and continued, Well, I thought this was just casual, and that I should break it off and have done with it, and I did break it off before my marriage. For nearly a year I did not see her or think about her. It seemed strange to Eugene himself to hear the description of his own condition. Then suddenly, I don't myself know why, Really, one sometimes believes in witchcraft. I saw her, and a worm crept into my heart, and it gnaws. I reproach myself. I understood the full horror of my action, that is to say, of the act I may commit any moment, and yet I myself turn to it, and if I have not committed it, is only because God preserved me. Yesterday I was on my way to see her when Liza sent for me. What, in the rain? Yes. I am worn out, uncle, and have decided to confess to you and to ask your help. Yes, of course. It's a bad thing on your own estate. People will get to know. I understand that Liza is weak, and that it is necessary to spare her. But why on your own estate? Again, Eugene tried not to hear what his uncle was saying, and hurried on to the core of the matter. Yes, save me from myself. That is what I ask of you. Today I was hindered by chance, but tomorrow or next time no one will hinder me, and she knows now. Don't leave me alone. Yes, all right, said his uncle. But are you really so in love? Ah, it is not that at all. 
It is not that. It is some kind of power that has seized me and holds me. I do not know what to do. Perhaps I shall gain strength, and then... Well, it turns out as I suggested, said his uncle. Let us be off to the Crimea. Yes, yes, let us go. And meanwhile, you will be with me and will talk to me. 18. The fact that Eugene had confided his secret to his uncle, but chiefly the sufferings of his conscience and the feeling of shame he experienced after that rainy day, sobered him. It was settled that they would start for Yalta in a week's time. During that week, Eugene drove to town to get money for the journey, gave instructions from the house and from the office concerning the management of the estate, again became gay and friendly with his wife, and began to awaken morally. So without having once seen Stepanida after that rainy day, he left with his wife for the Crimea. There he spent an excellent two months. He received so many new impressions that it seemed to him that the past was obliterated from his memory. In the Crimea they met former acquaintances and became particularly friendly with them, and they also made new acquaintances. Life in the Crimea was a continual holiday for Eugene, besides being instructive and beneficial. They became friendly there with the former marshal of the nobility of their province, a clever and liberal-minded man who became fond of Eugene and coached him and attracted him to his party. At the end of August, Liza gave birth to a beautiful, healthy daughter, and her confinement was unexpectedly easy. In September they returned home, the four of them, including the baby and its wet nurse, as Liza was unable to nurse it herself. Eugene returned home entirely free from the former horrors and quite a new and happy man. Having gone through all that a husband goes through when his wife bears a child, he loved his wife more than ever. His feeling for the child when he took it in his arms was a funny, new, very pleasant, and as it were, a tickling feeling. Another new thing in his life now was that, besides his occupation with the estate, thanks to his acquaintance with Dumchin, the ex-marshal, a new interest occupied his mind, that of the Zemstvo, partly an ambitious interest, partly a feeling of duty. In October there was to be a special assembly, at which he was to be elected. After arriving home, he drove once to town and another time to Dumchin. Of the torments of his temptation and struggle, he had forgotten even to think and could with difficulty recall them to mind. It seemed to him something like an attack of insanity he had undergone. To such an extent did he now feel free from it that he was not even afraid to make inquiries on the first occasion when he remained alone with the steward. As he had previously spoken to him about the matter, he was not ashamed to ask. Well, and is Sidor Pechnikov still away from home? he inquired. Yes, he is still in town. And his wife? Oh, she is a worthless woman. She is now carrying on with Zenovy. She is quite gone on the loose. Well, that is all right, thought Eugene. How wonderfully indifferent to it I am. How I have changed. Nineteen. All that Eugene had wished had been realized. He had obtained the property, the factory was working successfully, the beet crops were excellent, and his expected income would be a large one. His wife had borne a child satisfactorily, his mother-in-law had left, and he had been unanimously elected to the Zemstvo. Eugene was returning home from town after the election. He had been congratulated and had had to return thanks. He had had dinner and had drunk some five glasses of champagne. Quite new plans of life now presented themselves to him. He was driving home and thinking about these. It was the Indian summer, an excellent road, and a hot sun. As he approached his home, Eugene was thinking of how, as a result of this election, he would occupy among the people the position of which he had always dreamed. That is to say, one in which he would be able to serve them not only by production, which gave employment, but also by direct influence. He imagined how in another three years his own and the other peasants would think of him. For instance this one, he thought, driving just then through the village and glancing at a peasant who with a peasant woman was crossing the street in front of him, carrying a full water tub. They stopped to let his carriage pass. The peasant was old Pechnikov, and the woman was Stepanida. 
Eugene looked at her, recognized her, and was glad to feel that. He remained quite tranquil. She was still as good-looking as ever, but this did not touch him at all. He drove home. Well, may we congratulate you, said his uncle. Yes, I was elected. Capital, we must drink to it. Next day, Eugene drove about to see to the farming which he had been neglecting. At the outlying farmstead, a new thrashing machine was at work. While watching it, Eugene stepped among the women, trying not to take notice of them, but try as he would, he once or twice noticed the black eyes and red kerchief of Stepanida, who was carrying away the straw. Once or twice he glanced sideways at her and felt that something was happening, but could not account for it to himself. Only next day, when he again drove to the thrashing floor and spent two hours there quite unnecessarily, without ceasing to caress with his eyes the familiar, handsome figure of the young woman, did he feel that he was lost, irremediably lost. Again, those torments. Again, all that horror and fear, and there was no saving himself. What he expected happened to him. The evening of the next day, without knowing how, he found himself at her backyard by her hay shed, where in autumn they had once had a meeting. As though having a stroll, he stopped there lighting a cigarette. A neighboring peasant woman saw him, and as he turned back, he heard her say to someone, Go, he is waiting for you. On my dying word, he is standing there. Go, you fool. He saw how a woman, she, ran to the hay shed. But as a peasant had met him, it was no longer possible for him to turn back, and so he went home. 20. When he entered the drawing room, everything seemed strange and unnatural to him. He had risen that morning vigorous, determined to fling it all aside, to forget it, and not to allow himself to think about it. But without noticing how it occurred, he had all the morning not merely not interested himself in the work, but tried to avoid it. What had formerly been important and had cheered him was now insignificant. Unconsciously, he tried to free himself from business. It seemed to him that he had to do so in order to think and to plan, and he freed himself and remained alone. But as soon as he was alone, he began to wander about in the garden and the forest, and all of those spots were besmirched in his recollection by memories that gripped him. He felt that he was walking in the garden and pretending to himself that he was thinking out something, but that really he was not thinking out anything, but insanely and unreasonably expecting her, expecting that by some miracle she would be aware that he was expecting her and would come here at once and go somewhere where no one would see them or would come at night when there would be no moon and no one, not even she herself, would see. On such a night she would come and he would touch her body. There now, talking of breaking off when I wish to, said he to himself. Yes, and that is having a clean, healthy woman for one's health's sake. No, it seems one can't play with her like that. I thought I had taken her, but it was she who took me, took me, and does not let me go. Why, I thought I was free, but I was not free, and was deceiving myself when I married. It was all nonsense, fraud. From the time I had her, I experienced a new feeling, the real feeling of a husband. Yes, I ought to have lived with her. One of two lives is possible for me, that which I began with Liza. Service, estate management, the child, and people's respect. If that is life, it is necessary that she, Stepanida, should not be there. She must be sent away, as I said, or destroyed, so that she shall not exist. And the other life is this. For me to take her away from her husband, pay him money, disregard the shame and disgrace, and live with her. But in that case, it is necessary that Liza should not exist, nor Mimi, the baby. No, that is not so. The baby does not matter. But it is necessary that there should be no Liza, that she should go away, that she should know, curse me, and go away that she should know that I have exchanged her for a peasant woman, that I am a deceiver and a scoundrel. No, that is too terrible. It is impossible. But it might happen, he went on thinking. It might happen that Liza might fall ill and die, die, and then everything would be capital. Capital, 
Oh, scoundrel! No, if someone must die, it should be she. If she, Stepanida, were to die, how good it would be! Yes, that is how men come to poison or kill their wives or lovers. Take a revolver and go and call her, and instead of embracing her, shoot her in the breast and have done with it. Really, she is. A devil. Simply a devil. She has possessed herself of me against my own will. Kill? Yes. There are only two ways out, to kill my wife or her. For it is impossible to live like this. It is impossible. I must consider the matter and look ahead. If things remain as they are, what will happen? I shall again be saying to myself that I do not wish it, and that I will throw her off, but I shall only say it, and in the evening I shall be at her backyard, and she will know it and will come out. And if people know of it, and tell them my wife, or if I tell her myself, for I can't lie, I shall not be able to live so. I cannot. People will know. They will all know. Parasha and the blacksmith. Well, is it possible to live so? Impossible. There are only two ways out. To kill my wife, or to kill her. Yes, or else. Ah, yes, there is a third way. To kill myself, said he softly, and suddenly a shudder ran over his skin. Yes, kill myself. Then I shall not need to kill them. He became frightened, for he felt that only that way was possible. He had a revolver. Shall I really kill myself? It is something I never thought of. How strange it will be. He returned to his study and at once opened the cupboard where the revolver lay. But before he had taken it out of its case, his wife entered the room. 21. He threw a newspaper over the revolver. Again, the same, said she aghast when she had looked at him. What is the same? The same terrible expression that you had before and would not explain to me. Genya, dear one, tell me about it. I see that you are suffering. Tell me, and you will feel easier. Whatever it may be, it will be better than for you to suffer so. Don't I know that it is nothing bad? You know? While, tell me, tell me, tell me, I won't let you go. He smiled a piteous smile. Shall I? No, it is impossible, and there is nothing to tell. Perhaps he might have told her, but at that moment the wet nurse entered to ask if she should go for a walk. Liza went out to dress the baby. Then you will tell me. I will be back directly. Yes, perhaps. She never could forget the piteous smile with which he said this. She went out. Hurriedly, stealthily, like a robber, he seized the revolver and took it out of its case. It was loaded, yes, but long ago, and one cartridge was missing. Well, how will it be? He put it to his temple and hesitated a little, but as soon as he remembered Stepanida, his decision not to see her, his struggle, temptation, fall, and renewed struggle, he shuddered with horror. No, this is better, and he pulled the trigger. When Liza ran into the room, she'd only had time to step down from the balcony. He was lying face downwards on the floor. Black, warm blood was gushing from the wound, and his corpse was twitching. There was an inquest. No one could understand or explain the suicide. It never even entered his uncle's head that its cause could be anything in common with the confession Eugene had made to him two months previously. Vavara Alexeyevna assured them that she had always foreseen it. It had been evident from his way of disputing. Neither Liza nor Mary Pavlovna could at all understand why it had happened. But still, they did not believe what the doctors said, namely, that he was mentally deranged, a psychopath. They were quite unable to accept this, for they knew he was saner than hundreds of their acquaintances. And indeed, if Eugene Urtenev was mentally deranged, everyone is similarly insane. The most mentally deranged people are certainly those who see in others indications of insanity they do not notice in themselves. Philosophical Analysis of Leo Tolstoy's The Devil Leo Tolstoy's The Devil, 1889, is a powerful novella that explores themes of desire, temptation, guilt, and moral struggle 
written during a period of Tolstoy's life when he was preoccupied with spiritual crises and existential questions. The novella centers on the psychological and moral torment of its protagonist, Eugene Irtenev, as he grapples with forbidden lust and the consequences of succumbing to desire. As a complex moral fable, The Devil provides a fertile ground for philosophical analysis, focusing on the tension between human instinct and moral integrity, the nature of self-control, and the consequences of living inauthentically. 1. Desire and the duality of human nature. At the heart of The Devil is Tolstoy's exploration of desire, particularly sexual desire, and its relationship to human nature. Eugene Irtenev, a young and successful landowner, is driven by strong passions and finds himself entangled in an affair with a peasant woman, Stepanida. This affair is a reflection of Eugene's bodily urges and the darker side of human nature that Tolstoy often explored in his later works. The novella presents human desire not merely as a physical need, but as a disruptive force that complicates one's pursuit of moral integrity. Eugene's struggle to resist Stepanida after his marriage to Liza mirrors Tolstoy's belief in the duality of human existence, the conflict between reason and passion, between the spiritual and the carnal. Tolstoy had come to see human beings as divided between higher spiritual aspirations and baser instinctual drives. In The Devil, this conflict is vividly portrayed through Eugene's oscillation between wanting to live a moral, ordered life with his wife and his overpowering lust for Stepanida. Tolstoy's philosophical treatment of desire reflects his deep interest in asceticism, particularly his later belief in the suppression of physical appetites to achieve spiritual purity. Eugene's internal struggle illustrates Tolstoy's belief that unchecked desires lead to moral degradation, mental suffering, and ultimately, self-destruction. 2. Freedom, Determinism, and Moral Responsibility A major philosophical theme in The Devil is the question of human freedom and determinism. Eugene's actions raise questions about the extent to which individuals are free to choose their actions, or whether they are bound by their instincts and circumstances. From the beginning, Eugene's attraction to Stepanida is depicted as almost inevitable. Despite his initial rational decision to end the affair and marry Liza, Eugene remains haunted by Stepanida's presence as if controlled by forces beyond his will. Tolstoy seems to suggest that while human beings may believe they are rational agents, their actions are often determined by deep-seated instincts and environmental factors. Eugene's recurrent lapses into lust, even after his marriage, point to a deterministic view of human behavior, where individual choices are constrained by underlying psychological and social pressures. However, the devil is also a meditation on moral responsibility. Tolstoy does not absolve Eugene of blame for his actions, despite his apparent lack of control over his desires. Eugene's ultimate fate, whether he kills himself or Stepanida, depending on the version, illustrates the devastating consequences of failing to take responsibility for one's moral failings. Tolstoy suggests that moral responsibility entails the difficult task of mastering one's baser instincts and the inability to do so can lead to catastrophic results. 3. The Nature of Temptation and Evil In The Devil, Tolstoy explores the concept of evil, both in its metaphysical and psychological dimensions. The title itself evokes a symbolic representation of evil, suggesting that Stepanida is the embodiment of temptation, or perhaps that Eugene's internal lust is the devil haunting him. Tolstoy was deeply influenced by Christian theology, particularly its emphasis on the presence of evil as a constant force that tempts individuals away from virtue. The novella raises profound questions about the nature of evil, 
Is evil something external to the individual, embodied in the seductive allure of another person, or is it an internal force, emerging from within the human psyche? In Eugene's case, Tolstoy seems to suggest that evil is an internal phenomenon. Stepanida, while representing temptation, is not evil in herself. She is merely the catalyst for Eugene's downfall. It is Eugene's failure to control his own desires that ultimately leads him to contemplate murder or suicide. Tolstoy's portrayal of temptation in The Devil reflects his belief in the importance of spiritual discipline and the need for individuals to resist the seductive allure of physical pleasure. The title of the novella implies a Christian view of evil as a test, with Eugene's moral downfall symbolizing humanity's perennial struggle with sin. Tolstoy uses Eugene's inner turmoil to explore the existential weight of human choices, particularly the choices we make when confronted with temptation. 4. Tolstoy's Moralism and the Quest for Purity Tolstoy's later writings are characterized by a strict moralism reflecting his personal quest for spiritual purity and his rejection of worldly desires. In The Devil, this moralism is evident in the way Eugene's moral weakness is portrayed. Tolstoy had come to believe that true happiness and inner peace could only be achieved through the renunciation of bodily desires and the pursuit of a pure, ascetic life. This belief is reflected in Eugene's eventual realization that his desires are ruining his life. Eugene's inability to resist Stepanida, despite his love for his wife, symbolizes the broader human struggle to live according to moral principles while constantly being pulled by the temptations of the flesh. Tolstoy's view of sexuality in The Devil is markedly negative, presenting it as a force that corrupts and destroys. His portrayal of Eugene's descent into despair can be seen as a critique of hedonism and the belief that physical pleasure leads to happiness. Instead, Tolstoy argues that moral purity achieved through self-discipline and the rejection of worldly desires is the only path to true fulfillment. 5. Social Class and Moral Decay Another significant aspect of The Devil is Tolstoy's exploration of the relationship between social class and moral decay. Eugene's affair with Stepanida highlights the power dynamics at play between the aristocracy and the peasantry. Stepanida, a lower-class woman, becomes a symbol of the degradation of the noble class, as Eugene's lust for her ultimately leads to his downfall. Tolstoy had long been critical of the Russian aristocracy, seeing it as a morally corrupt and decadent class. In The Devil, he portrays Eugene's sexual exploitation of Stepanida as emblematic of the broader moral decay of the aristocracy. While Eugene initially believes he can control his desires and live a respectable life, his failure to do so suggests that the aristocratic way of life is inherently corrupting. Tolstoy's depiction of Eugene's moral crisis can be seen as a broader critique of the class system in Russia, where the nobility's exploitation of the lower classes leads to both personal and societal ruin. 6. Existential Guilt and the Search for Redemption One of the central themes in The Devil is existential guilt and the search for redemption. Eugene's internal struggle is not just about controlling his desires, but also about grappling with the overwhelming sense of guilt that comes from his betrayal of Liza and his moral failure. As his guilt intensifies, Eugene becomes increasingly desperate, contemplating extreme measures to free himself from the burden of his conscience. Tolstoy's treatment of guilt in The Devil reflects his broader existential concerns. Eugene's guilt is not simply the result of his actions, but also stems from a deeper awareness of his failure to live according to his moral ideals. This existential guilt 
drives him to the brink of madness as he realizes that his inability to control his desires has shattered his self-conception as a moral person. The novella raises profound questions about the possibility of redemption. Can Eugene ever be free from his guilt, or is he doomed to live with the consequences of his actions? Tolstoy seems to suggest that redemption is possible, but only through a complete transformation of the self. Eugene's contemplation of suicide or murder can be seen as symbolic of his desire to destroy his old self, the self that was enslaved by desire, and to be reborn as a new, morally pure individual. 7. Tolstoy's Vision of Moral Integrity Tolstoy's vision of moral integrity in the devil is rooted in his belief in the importance of self-discipline, spiritual purity, and the rejection of material and physical desires. For Tolstoy, true moral integrity requires individuals to live in accordance with their highest moral principles, even when faced with temptation. Eugene's failure to do so results in his moral downfall, illustrating the dangers of allowing desire to override reason and conscience. However, The Devil is not merely a didactic moral tale. Tolstoy's portrayal of Eugene's inner struggle is deeply sympathetic, reflecting his understanding of the complexity of human nature. While Tolstoy believed in the importance of moral purity, he also recognized the difficulty of achieving it. In Eugene's torment, readers can see a reflection of their own struggles with desire temptation, and guilt, making the devil a profoundly human story as well as a philosophical meditation on the nature of morality. Conclusion In The Devil, Tolstoy grapples with some of the most fundamental questions of human existence, the nature of desire, the conflict between freedom and determinism, the presence of evil, and the quest for moral integrity. Through the character of Eugene Irtenev, Tolstoy presents a powerful exploration of the consequences of succumbing to temptation and the existential guilt that follows.